Coming up, we talk to a ProPublica contributor about the missing histories behind Native American works in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's National Women's Health Week. We get tips on how to make your health a priority. Plus, a tribal elder is sharing her story of trauma and triumph with young leaders. I'm Malia Chavez. Join us for those interviews plus headlines from the ICT Newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Arizona State University welcomes 3,500 indigenous students from Arizona and across the nation. It serves one of the largest populations of indigenous students among U.S. colleges and universities. We created a sense of place for tribal nations to create futures of their own making through community outreach, and research, taught by world-class indigenous faculty where they see a reflection of themselves and their experiences. Find community at ASU. Thank you for joining us. We continue our coverage on the disputes by Native American students wearing regalia at graduation ceremonies. On Monday, Lena Black sued Oklahoma's Broken Arrow Public School District for violating her religious and free speech rights. The Oto, Missouri citizen says she was forced to remove an eagle plume from her graduation cap in May 2022. Black says the plume is a protected religious item and is important in her culture. She is now seeking at least $50,000 in damages. Earlier this month, Oklahoma Governor Kevin Stitt vetoed a bill that would ensure students can wear tribal regalia. Stitt said the law would open a, quote, Pandora's box for groups to demand special favor to wear whatever they want at the ceremonies. One of Black's attorneys, Morgan Saunders, says it is unfortunate that students have to file suit to protect their rights. This lawsuit, the timing is a little bit of a coincidence, but it demonstrates why this decision can't be left up to individual school districts and why there needs to be clarity about the lack of discretion when it comes to this practice. A Broken Arrow spokesperson says the district has not yet seen the lawsuit and has no comment at this time. Moving to New Hampshire, Indigenous students are voicing their concerns over the ancestral remains found at Dartmouth College. In March, the Ivy League school shared its discovery of 15 Native American ancestors in their collections. It said some of the bones were used in teaching labs as recently as fall of 2022. That news has some Indigenous students rethinking their relationship with the college. Quapaw citizen and Dartmouth senior Anili Johnson Jennings says it's hard to accept that her college used Native remains for its own benefit. Jamie Powell, a citizen of the Osage Nation, first identified the bones as being Native American during a November audit. She said it is important for her, as an Indigenous person, to treat the ancestors with care and respect. Dartmouth College says it is working to return the remains and is also working to repair its relationship with Native students and alumni. Last weekend marked the 12th annual Moose Hide Campaign Day. The event raises awareness against violence of w Indigenous women and girls in Canada. APTN's Tina House has the story. Twelve years ago, father and daughter Raven and Paula Sert were on a family hunting trip along the Highway of Tears in northern BC and they had a discussion about violence against women and children. That's when the Lissert family decided to launch a campaign to end violence against women and children and called it the Moose Hide Campaign. We were blessed with the moose. Um, we tanned it up, cut that hide up into a bunch of little squares and asked people to wear it as their everyday commitment and their everyday reminder uh, that we don't want to do violence in our lives, that we want safe communities um, for women and children across the country. And their call to action has been heard loud and clear. Over 2,000 people took to the streets of downtown Victoria to march to the lawn of the BC legislature. 
Joining them was BC Premier David Eby, who made his own personal pledge. I want to join everyone here today uh, as a man in making my commitment personally uh, to doing the work to end gender-based violence and racism, the, and also uh, to join with all the boys and men here that are making that commitment. I know as Premier of a government, we have an added responsibility. I have an added responsibility that our government does all we can to end racism and violence. Pala Helsia, Lorelai Williams and her dance group Butterflies in Spirit were there to perform. But first, some of her butterflies, who all represent someone that they loved, who is either still missing or is found murdered, address the crowd. I represent my relative, Angeline Pete. She went missing in May 2011. Tansa, hello, my name is Madeline. Traditional name is Sukaski Squeo, Strong Earth Woman. And I'm here representing Georgina Pappen, who was found on the Picton farm. And she was my street mom. Hi, hi, all my relations. Hi there, um, my traditional name is Odemengiza Sque, which means Strawberry Moon Woman. And I'm here representing my mother and whose name I share with, Sarah DeVries. And then it was time for them to share their original song and dance. The Moose Side campaign has now given out over 4 million Moose Side pins across Canada. Tina House, APTN National News, Victoria. The hit show Dark Winds has released a highly anticipated trailer for its second season. The series is set to continue following Zon McLaren as Lieutenant Joe Leaphorn and Kiowa Gordon as Jim Chi. Country's got the devil in it, Joe. Together, they solve mysteries across the Navajo Nation based in the 1970s. The show, airing on AMC, is based on the series of books written by Tony Hillerman. It also features Robert Redford and George R.R. R. Martin as executive producers. The first season of Dark Winds was filmed on the Navajo Nation and other tribal communities in New Mexico. The second season will premiere on AMC Plus on July 30th. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. The Metropolitan Museum of Art announced last week it is hiring four experts to investigate the history of some of the works in its collections. That follows news reports showing that some of the items displayed at the Met were allegedly stolen or lacked evidence that they were legally obtained. Joining us today is Kathleen Sharp, who is a contributor to ProPublica series called The Repatriation Project. Welcome to the ICT Newscast, Kathleen. Thank you. It's great to be here. You are the journalist behind this reporting. At a high level, tell us about the missing uh, history for the artwork in this collection. Well, uh, the Met is a public you know, nonprofit. It's funded by uh, federal taxes, and it also has to, re you know, follow federal law. What I found was that there was very little uh, provenance or history behind many of these incredible uh, Native American pieces, which the Met called art. But the bigger issue is that uh, the Met had not alerted the tribes as they were legally required to under NAGPRA, that they had their objects and give the tribes an opportunity to repatriate them. So, um, you know, that's a failure to comply with the law and it's uh, kind of a chronic problem with the Met. In your reporting, you actually found that it's common for pieces in museums to have gaps in their histories, but what makes this particular case different? Well, in this case, uh, it was, uh, these collections were actually from a private party, uh, Chuck and Valerie Diker, and they clearly loved Native American works, but they'd done very little work to understand where they came from or how uh, they came uh, to them, and then they gave it to the Met or loaned it. And many of these pieces have traumatic histories. Uh, they were taken during massacres or at times of war on the battlefield. Some pieces had gaps of 2,000 years, which uh, experts told me was an indication that either the pieces were stolen or were fakes. But in either case, uh, the Met had an opportunity and a, a duty to really look into these pieces and figure out 
where they came from, and then on the other hand, to give the tribes an opportunity to look at them and uh, re, you know, claim them for repatriation. Speaking about the tribal nations, can you tell us more about who you spoke to and what the reactions were from indigenous leaders? Well, I spent a lot of time with the Hopi, uh, with uh, the Rosebud uh, Sioux, um, with many tribes actually, and I narrowed it down to four. And to a person, I think I talked to about you know, 24 different tribal experts or officers, and many of them didn't know that their pieces were in the Met, and others were kind of surprised and shocked and really upset that the Met had not contacted them. Uh, some of these pieces were sacred. Some of them belonged to ancestors. Um, and it's, it underscores sort of the long, many century old uh, aspect of cultural genocide that has happened in Indian country. Kathleen, can you give us an idea of just some of the objects that you're talking about? I'd love to hear more details about uh, what actually is at play here? Well, one of the pieces we looked at was an, uh, uh, a teepee. It was called a miniature teepee by uh, the Met. But I learned from the tribe and from Ben Road, who was at the time the THPO of the tribe, that it was actually an educational uh, piece that uh, during the 1880s, the tribal elders would try and instill pride in the young uh, people of the tribe about the amazing history and the amazing uh, um, talents of their warriors during uh, wars against the U.S. Army. It was also a way to teach children how to erect their own teepee so that they wouldn't lose this art and skill over the decades. So the Met sort of mislabeled it, and it's really a lovely, lovely piece. Another piece we looked at was um, from an Apache tribe, and unfortunately the Met didn't specify which Apache tribe, but it was a beautifully beaded um, uh, quill set with arrows. And according to uh, Raymond Riley of the White Mountain Apache, he believed very strongly that it was uh, probably buried with a warrior, it was funereal, and it should not be on display. Um, so those are two of the more beautiful pieces. There was also um, a bowl made by the very famous Hopi potter, Nampeo. And because she was an independent artist, she sold her pieces independently. Um, it's pretty certain that that was not looted. And it's an example of something that, um, you know, was probably legally purchased by the Dikers, uh, displayed by the Met, um, by this artist who had agency of her own and, and freely sold her work to the outside world. Now that your reporting has been um, uh, released, what has been the response from the Met or the Dikers? The Dikers have not um, uh, agreed to an interview. I've sent many questions uh, and they refer to the Met. The Met has I think in response to my story and many other stories about looted art at the museum, has responded by hiring four provenance experts or planning to, and they've also uh, planned to hire a NAGPRA expert to overlook uh, many thousands of Native American items that they have. So um, that's a step in the right direction. And even better would be for the Met to comply with the law and alert the tribes uh, whose objects they have, that they do have them and invite them to claim them if they want. Well, ProPublica contributor Kathleen Sharp, thank you so much for your time and your reporting. It's my pleasure, thank you. National Women's Health Week is celebrated each year in the U.S. beginning on Mother's Day. Joining us today is Santee descendant Sasha Houston Brown, who is a communications and advocacy consultant for Blue Cross Blue Shield. Hi, Sasha. Welcome back. 
Thanks so much for having me. Last week, a U.S. task force gave new guidelines for mammograms. What should Native women know about these new guidelines? Yeah, so the new guidelines really tell us that really beginning at age 40, women should get screened for breast cancer every other year. So for all the aunties and moms and sisters, uh, really encourage each other get out. Um, early detection is key in preventing breast cancer. The old guidelines said 50, and we know that, you know, our communities face those higher rates, so early screening is key for overall health. For uh, Native women who go to um, the hospital or the clinic, sometimes it can feel really daunting. I know I feel that way myself. Um, what kinds of advice would you have for Native women to really take control of um, themselves and their bodies when going to these kinds of appointments? You know, knowing your own body is key, right? Like knowing what feels normal for you is so important and it's gonna be different for every single person. So getting a feel for, you know, what what your normal sense of normal is helps to uh, understand what, you know, when something's off or it doesn't feel right. And I really like to tell people that if you are in pain, if something doesn't feel right, please speak up. Um, I know it can be so daunting and feel like you're not heard, but it's so important to never ignore pain. And if you feel like you're not being listened to, please ask to see another nurse or a different doctor. It's so important that our voices are heard. I think the other uh, part of that um, statement is that, of course, health and wellness takes many forms. It's also mental health. Maybe talk about that. You know, health is so holistic, uh, mind, body, spirit. Native women are under such constant levels of toxic stress. It's really important for us to take time, even a few minutes a day, to prioritize your own well-being, right? It, it's cliche, but it's true. You can't take care of others or show up in life unless you're prioritizing your own health and wellness. So, you know, if you are struggling with mental health, please reach out to some of those resources that exist um, in your community. You know, we have things like the Strong Hearts Helpline um, and also do what feels good for you. Maybe that's going to ceremony. Maybe that's going out for a walk. Find those moments each day to replenish yourself. Uh, last week on the show, we had a dentist on the show to talk about uh, oral care. Um, and we actually found that sometimes pregnant women with um, a lack of oral health can actually translate to their babies. For um, women who are pregnant and maybe are looking for more resources to help them along their pregnancy or make sure that they're having healthy children, what advice would you have there? Yeah, again, I think it's so important to know your own body, to be a good advocate for yourself. Um, I also think it's important for, you know, our relatives to support our new moms to be and really show up for them. You know, sometimes going to appointments with a loved one is so important to be an advocate. Um, also prioritizing nutrition, um, getting out for those, those walks, prioritizing mental health and overall well-being is so critical, um, you know, really those, that time for, for our pregnant moms, in many ways, it is that ceremony and care for them and bringing that new life into the world is of the utmost importance. So really advocate for all those new moms in your life, show up, help them out um, and take those small steps to care for yourself when you are with child. And the flip side, of course, is elders and, and caring for elders in our community. Absolutely. Um, you know, I definitely would encourage that, you know, all of our elders and our, our family members to support our elders in terms of taking charge of their own health. Uh, walking is a really big thing I like to recommend, you know, um, if you can getting out even for a short five, six, eight minute walk is huge. A lot of our tribal fitness centers also have tracks that are really great for indoor walking, treadmill, um, knowing a lot of our communities are not accessible, right, for walking or running. So finding creative ways and really prioritizing our elders. Maybe we bring our elders a healthy meal once a week. Um, it's so important and we really need to live those values. When it comes to nutrition, are there any small steps that Indigenous women can take to better their health? Absolutely. Nutrition can be so overwhelming. I always like to tell people 
think about what you can add into your diet versus take out, right? Instead of removing your favorite foods, let's think about adding in some fresh and healthy foods. So maybe that's adding in a serving of veggies at lunch and dinner. Maybe it's adding in a serving of accessible protein, deer meat, fish, you know, some traditional foods in one meal. Um, also as a reminder, Frozen fruits and veggies are just as nutritious as fresh and a lot of times more accessible in our communities. Um, so those little steps really add up. You don't need to deprive yourself. Think about it from an abundant standpoint and those things you can add into your meals. Well, Sasha Houston Brown on National Women's Health Week, thank you so much. Thank you. An elder of the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs is sharing her life story through a new book called My Name is Lamouche. It's intended for young readers and provides a first-hand account of events in Native American history. Happy to be here to talk to you about my book. I think it's important. Um, tell us what inspired you to write this book and why to do it now. Well, I felt it was important because sometimes a lot of our history is not truthful and you know growing up on the Columbia River with my great-grandparents I always felt like we need to keep our history going before it's all gone so I felt it was important to respect my grandmother's wishes was to continue writing or you know write a book about you know who we are on the river so I thought it was good to do this Another goal of this book is to remind young people about the cultural connection Indigenous people have with the environment and the areas surrounding them. Why was that important for you to include in this book? Well, I felt be because of uh, the traumatized life our elders, our grandmothers and grandfathers have been through, I thought it would be a nice change of life to share the importance of who we are, our culture, and the things that we do, you know, to keep our our, gener our younger generation to know it's important to learn who they are. The book actually has fact boxes that provide historical and cultural context for your story. Tell us about that. Well, I just said, uh, you know, like when I was raised by my great grandparents, they would always tell me stories about their life and how things should be and the way it is, you know, and since fishing is part of our, you know, salmon is part of our sustenance, we always want to keep our traditional foods, you know, uh, and this is, uh, it shows, you know, our history of the river before it was inundated on March 10th, 1957 by the Dalles Dam. So I figured, you know, why just, just share two books when I was little and not continue on with the way of life before we lose it. Did you always know that you wanted to write a book? Well, I, I kind of thought about it. I mean, when I was a student at Portland State, I figured, well, geez, you know, I, I had inspirational older elders, like an elder that uh, she's uh, at University of Oregon. She was an influential person to me, and she wrote books on our language, you know, and our language is one of our biggest losses. So I think it's important to do that. You know, I want to share our history. I want to share our stories before they're all gone, you know. So. Although your story is based on historic trauma, it's also very inspirational. Um, to what do you attribute your personal resilience? Well, what I wanted to do is because we've been through so much trauma and, you know, historical, generational, intergenerational trauma. I wanted to change all of that to resiliency because that's what we need to do. You know, I give our younger generation a better life than we've had. When uh, young readers are reading this book, what do you ultimately hope that they're taking away? 
that they will see the life that I had lived growing up as a young child, you know. It was important to grow up that way because I was happy. We had a happy, you know, way of life, even though we always thought that we were the only, you know, ethnic group you know, at the time. But I just think it's important for our younger generation to read the truthful story of who we are you know, our side of the story. Very quickly here, I understand that there's a launch for this book happening very soon. Tell us about that. Well, I'm just excited. I didn't realize the hard work you had to go through just to publish a book. You know, I just wanted to share my story and felt it was important. And right now, I'm just happy uh, that I'm able to even launch the book at certain places, you know. So I'm just glad that I'm able to share my story. I want to thank Confluence for this and some other people that have been there for me. And it makes me feel good that I can actually continue on my way of life with sharing stories for the younger people to know that they can continue on their life you know, maybe make it better for themselves. We are all storytellers. That is indeed true. Linda, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.